podcast, we bring knowledge to empower you and address the root cause of your disease. Our goal is to interest you in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. Today, we're fortunate enough to be joined by Dr. Emeka Obidi. Dr. Obidi is a board-certified pediatrician, practicing for over 17 years in Western Maryland, where he also lives, with his wife and their three kids. Dr. Abidi is the founder and CEO of Partners in Pediatrics and Family Health, which is a family medical practice where he leads a team of four family medical providers caring for both pediatrics and adult patients. He's also the founder and CEO of Newborn Prep Academy, where he runs an online course called the Newborn Preparation Course, which helps new expectant uh, and recently delivered mothers to understand how to care for their newborn babies and what to expect so they can feel confident and empowered as new moms and ultimately enjoy their babies. Dr. Obidi, I want to thank you for joining us here on the Self Care Forum podcast. How are you, sir? I am well, thank you, Dr. Patichu. Thank you for having me on. Now, the I... pleasure is all mine, Doc. The pleasure is really all mine. So one of the things that I'd love to start on is, is really to find out a little bit about our guests uh, and their background. So if you will, please, what inspired you to become uh, a physician? Wow, that's such an interesting question. And and unfortunately, the the initial answer is quite boring because it was just, I just wanted to help people. <laughs> I know it sounds like run of the mill, but it really was that, you know, for as long as I can remember being a little boy, um, I grew up in Nigeria and that was just um, the, my, my dream. Now in medical school, I wanted to become um, an ophthalmologist and that was the dream. I had a local um, family friend who was an ophthalmologist who would let me come and shadow her on my vacation. And I just enjoyed being able to examine the eye and do sit in eye surgery. It was wonderful. But then I went to med school, went through med school. Uh, so I went through yeah, my right med school. And after med school in Nigeria, you kind of do an internship year mm -hmm. where you get to do three months in internal medicine, surgery, OBGYN, and pediatrics. And after my pediatric rotation, I just fell in love with pediatrics. It was such a magical time for me. Um, really took me by surprise because I really didn't think I was going to enjoy it as much as I did. And of course, you know, you know, in Nigeria, um, as in a lot of developing countries, um, it's not necessarily a very easy rotation because you're seeing lots of sick kids. You're seeing kids, maybe even some kids who pass away that shouldn't really have it. They were in a more resource country. So it was a hard rotation, but it was a very rewarding one. And I just I just fell in love with pediatrics and um, knew that was what I wanted to do. And you've been doing it for 17 years. <laughs> so clearly it's something that you've been passionate about, right? Time creeps up on you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. But I think, you know, if you enjoy something, it, it doesn't really feel like it's, yeah. it's you know, it, it feels like time is just flying um, as you're doing it. So, you know, motherhood, uh, overall parenthood is something that is perhaps one of the most significant aspects of a person's life. Um, and I'm speaking from experience as you know, my wife mm -hmm. just recently gave birth about 11 months ago. My daughter, mm -hmm. she's 11 months old. And that was a drastically different, uh, you know, it, it brought a whole set of changes into our lives. And, and so one of the things I would often find myself thinking, you know, was when, when I would talk to my loved one, I would say, you guys didn't prepare me for this. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Like, you guys didn't tell me that it would, you know, the lack of sleep and all these different things. Mm -hmm. I just, I guess I always felt that, you know, things would just fall into place and, and thank goodness we've had some help. But, you know, for, for um, new mothers, what are some things that you would advise them? What are some things that maybe uh, some kernels of wisdom that you think new or an expectant mother should know about parenthood and some of the changes that they'll, they'll undergo? Yeah, you know, um, in more recent years, I sort of really started to hone in on the fact that I really enjoy of all of pediatrics. I enjoy all of pediatrics, but especially enjoy that interaction with a new mom and her newborn. Um, and because that's such a very vulnerable time for lots of moms and um, thankfully, I've been able to, over the years, uh, realize how much value I can bring and how much help and support I can bring to a new mom in that period. And I have seen, over the years, just observing moms, I mean, I've 
taking care of probably over 2000 babies at this point and their moms by proxy. And yeah, it's crazy how time flies. But um, I have realized that one big uh, portion of how or one big part of what allows a mom to really successfully navigate this period is just the mindset she has around motherhood and around caring for a newborn. And um, because it's so easy for moms to fall into um, this just almost like a natural tendency to doubt themselves. Um, it's called mom guilt for, for good reason. They feel guilty about not being sufficient, feeling they can't, you know, do this as well as the next mom next as a mom next door. Um, they have and social media hasn't made this any better because you go on social media and you see all the moms who are supposedly doing this perfectly and how mm -hmm. um, you fall short of all of those standards, right? Mm -hmm. um, so one of the tips I can leave moms is just to really, um, especially if your baby hasn't come in yet, take some time to start to think through um, the journey you're about to embark on and really start to understand that there are some fundamental things I really believe in that um, I've coined the confident mom mindset, um, which really um, has three three sort of tenets to it. The one is that you're the best mom for your baby. And that's such a simple statement, but a really powerful statement if a mom can sit with that statement for a while and really allow the full impact of that hit her, that she's the best mother for this child. Um, it's not the woman next door. It's not her mom or her sister. It's not, you know, the woman on, um, on social media, um, no one but herself. And it's a very, I believe, empowering thought and one that allows a mom to say, okay, you know, however this child came to me, whether it's natural birth or adoption or however, you know, um, um, this child came to me, I am the best mother for this child. I'm able to provide what this child needs. Mm -hmm. And to understand that um, you also have everything it takes to care for this child. Um, yes, you may not have all of that information, but you're able to get information you need. I think when you allow yourself to um, really internalize that powerful um, thought that I have all it takes to care for this child successfully, it allows you to really relax and care for this child and not worry about what's missing and what's lacking. And when you realize, okay, there is some information you um, need, you can go and just seek it, but from a place of strength that, oh, I am the best mom for this baby. I need this information for my baby. And I'm going to get that information for my baby as opposed to, you know, oh my God, I'm terrible at this. I can't do this, you know, oh, and then you, when you go out to seek that information, you're doubting whatever you hear, you know, you're vacillating between a thousand and one opinions, um, and you're not able to really um, sort of hone in on what your child needs, what your baby needs, and really focusing on that. Um, and I really feel also that a mom, you know, she'll also adopt this mindset that, um, that she's in charge of her baby's care, not anyone else. And so... Um, she has everything she needs to care for this baby. She can, um, and that baby can adapt to her. That's one real tip I can leave moms is babies are very adaptable. <laughs> you know, they really are. If you think about it, babies grow, uh, are raised in so many different environments around the world, right? Um, the conditions here in the United States are different from the conditions in Nigeria where I grew, grew up, different from the conditions in Europe, or in, um, you know, in Asia, the all different conditions, but babies thrive in all these environments. And so at the end of the day, um, your baby only needs some very basic things. They need to be fed, they need to be clothed, <laughs> they need to be loved, <laughs> and that's it. You know, and sometimes the things that we can worry about or moms can worry about, like what kind of diaper they're using and, you know, how to, what to feed the baby, what kind of, whether to breastfeed the formula feed. Um, there are a number of different things they can worry about that oftentimes at the end of the day, um, don't make a humongous impact on this baby thriving. So I, I want to touch base on one of the points that you mentioned, which is, you know, the concern for how you're going to feed this child. I know that during our pregnancy or the birth of our daughter, you know, my wife was adamant that we would breastfeed. Mm -hmm. 
constantly read up on the benefits and everything. And I think now in this day and age with everything going on with the formula shortage in the United States, mm-hmm. it's, you know, I think that was a wise decision. But in, in your experience, um, what are some of the advantages of breastfeeding as opposed to maybe formula fed or formula feeding uh, a child? Yeah, you know, there are definitely advantages to breastfeeding, and I'll come to them in a second. But I do want to sort of um, pause and say that at the end of the day, you do want to make sure your baby's fed. Mm-hmm. And there are some advantages that we're going to go through a bre- with breastfeeding in, in a little bit. Uh, but sometimes not all moms are able to breastfeed. Some mm-hmm. moms, you know, um, either through a medical condition or through personal choice, um, or just whatever is going on with them. Maybe they have a medication they're on that precludes them from being able to breastfeed. And um, I think we live in a, in, a, in a time where there's a lot of mom guilt that gets thrown around, this, depending on what a mom decides to feed her baby, um, which really doesn't serve moms well. Um, but that being said, there are benefits to breastfeeding. Um, they are antibodies that a breast milk produces that uh, really protect your baby from um, some con- medical conditions. They are less likely to have urinary tract infections and ear infections, um, your respiratory infections in general. Um, breast milk, uh, breastfeeding does protect also mom that they have a slight um, decreased uh, a, a, a incidence of uterine cancer, um, oh, really? breast cancer. Yes, for mom. So that's, you know, some protective um, uh, properties there. Um, of course, it's convenient, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Now, of course, that's relative too, because sometimes moms, it might be convenient for them to bottle feed and have to breastfeed. Yeah. But that's more of a societal thing if she's not comfortable breastfeeding wherever she is. Um, but generally, you don't have to prepare breast milk. It's ready um, right. for you when you need to use it. Um, and um, yeah, so th- they are, I mean, and also... There have been some studies that show some 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 benefits to brain development and and vision um, and just so supporting your visual health. Um, so a number of benefits to breastfeeding for sure. That where a mom is able to breastfeed uh, or allows herself to be able to try, you know, to breastfeed first and see how that goes. That I think it's worth trying for sure and worth doing. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. So what is a what is a uh, common thing that you um, maybe uh, advise your patients or new mothers when it comes to uh, the use of pacifiers? Because I, I, you know, as a new parent, I my wife took uh, certain stances that um, uh-huh. had already researched and everything. So this was new to me. So I just kind of had to go along yes. and honor her. Uh, but, you know, what is, what is the, the your position on, on the use of pacifiers? Is it good for their teeth or their gut? Is it bad? I, what's going on with that? Sure. It's really interesting because that's one of those things where um, the benefits either way. So um, there are actually studies that have shown that there's a slightly, there's a decreased chance of SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, if a baby goes to bed with a pacifier. Okay. Uh, now, if it falls off, falls out while they're sleeping, the recommendation is not to put it back in. But if they fall asleep with the pacifier, it actually decreases the risk of um, SIDS in sudden infant death syndrome. Um, now, that being said, um, there's also a risk of nipple confusion, which is where um, a baby doesn't latch as well anymore if you introduce um, a pacifier early. Now, that's not very common, but that is a possibility. So oftentimes I will say to moms, if you're struggling with the latch earlier on um, in that whole uh, in getting breastfeeding established, um, I will not introduce or I will advise against introducing the pacifier. Mm-hmm. But if your baby really has a good latch and has gotten that mechanism down packed and you, you know don't really have much of a difficulty getting them to latch on when it's time to breastfeed, then you could introduce a pacifier if you so choose, because there is a benefit to it, especially when the baby is going to bed. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it's one of those things where I think that, you know, a mom just needs to sort of understand her situation, a personal situation, understand her baby and, and decide. Now, of course, if you do decide to offer a pacifier, then you have to kind of go through um, taking that away at some point. Yeah. And that's where there can be an issue if... Um, 
the baby doesn't want to give it up and now they're a toddler and they still have a pacifier on because that can start to affect dentition, especially when they go past a year of age. Um, so I usually tell parents, okay, this is going to be hard. You're going to choose a week where you're ready for the craziness. You're going to wait for trash day. Then you're going to put all the pacifiers in the trash. It's going to go out with the trash. <laughs> so you're not going to pull it out when your baby starts to fuss and go through three days of hell. And they usually find by the fourth day. <laughs> and so this, this, this ties into our next question, right? Because one of the advantages or one of the benefits of giving a child a pacifier is that it usually pacifies them. It calms them down. But as you know, mm -hmm. if you were to just remove that pacifier, they cry. And mm -hmm. so babies yeah. don't really have words, right? They, you know, mm -hmm. they kind of have this, um, you know, either I'm happy or I'm upset. <laughs> so <laughs> happy, usually a, a smile or a good laugh. But when they're upset, you know, it could be a million things, mm -hmm. but they just cry. So how long, you know, should we let babies cry or should we cater to them where as soon as a child cries, you know, you're supposed to jump up and, 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 you know, offer them different things to appease them. What is the uh, appropriate way to deal with a child that, that cries frequently or constantly cries? Yeah, that's always a very challenging one, right? Especially when your newborn is very young, when, when, it's all very new and you haven't really gotten to understand your baby very well. Um, as time progresses, the cry actually is different depending on what they need. Um, and it's funny, but over time you can tell if they're crying just because they want to be held, if they're crying because they're hungry, if they're crying because they're wet, um, you can you can get a sense sometimes. But earlier on it's difficult. So I think you know, when a newborn cries, um, well. Before I say the next thing, the other the other thing to keep in mind is that your newborn also is learning how to. Um, one of the things you want to teach them also is how to be able to self soothe as well, mm -hmm. and so I think you have this balancing act that you have to play. So when a newborn cries, I would respond to them, especially earlier on in the first few weeks, a uh, couple of months of pregnant um, of a newborn's life. I will respond to them, see what they need. Um, see if they're wet, see if it's time to feed them. Are they giving you cues that they want to feed? Um, some babies may just get very fussy when it's time for bedtime. So maybe you can see that they're giving you cues that they're ready to sleep. So if it's something you can identify that they need, providing that for them, right? And again, in the first few weeks, um, I will you know, definitely soothe that baby, um, mm -hmm. pick them up, hold them, cuddle them, do whatever you need to do, provide for their needs. As the baby starts to get older also, and a few a couple months out, I will start to also deliberately or, or be more deliberate about when you intervene. So I will always respond, just make sure there's nothing they need right away. But if the other needs are met, you could step away for a minute or two and see how they do and see this, if they settle on their own. Mm -hmm. um, and if they don't come back, settle them down again, see if they need something and step away for a longer period of time. The crying in and of itself isn't dangerous. Um, now, of course, if you're, you leave your baby crying for, for hours or even, you know, 30, 40 minutes crying, that's, that's excessive. But I think leaving them for short periods of time to cry for five, 10 minutes or so, um, again, that's going to be dependent on the mom's te um, temperament as well. Right. Because at the end of the day, you also want a mom who, um, is in the right mindset, uh, a mental state to care for this newborn as well. And so if mom can't stand the baby crying at all, uh, making her go, go through watching her baby cry even for a couple of minutes, you know, might be difficult. Uh, yeah. But if you're able to allow them cry for a few minutes and see they settle themselves, especially if you they don't need seem to need anything, I think that, that that's certainly safe. The studies have not shown that it le leads to some... Um, issue with attachments with the with the parents or or at least increase them um stress um, or anything of the sort thank you for that doc mm -hmm. so you know as the child gets a little older you know cl probably closer to one years old uh, maybe around one or two ish you know parents often find that you know the child is more mobile maybe they're crawling maybe they're walking but you know it also means that they tend to be a little bit more needy. 
And so one of the things that parents often try to do is distract these kids. Now, of course, we live in a day and age where you have little tablets and you have mm. little smartphones that you can, you know, that you can give a child and everything like that. So what is your advice when it comes to using uh, electronic technology to, uh, I don't want to say distract, because you also have many educational programs on these on these platforms, yeah. right? So what is your position on using electronic devices to entertain or maybe even distract children? Yeah, I think that's also another area where um, one really just needs to be able to realize what the baby needs or what the, the, the toddler needs. Um, it's easy to be able to stick them in front of a tablet or a screen um, because it distracts them or it keeps them entertained. Now, of course, like you said, there are educational programs that you can play these days, and there may be a role to some of that. But the studies have actually shown that babies will learn better and toddlers will mm -hmm. learn better when they're interacting with a human being. Even if you provide the same content via a screen and via an, a live person, they will actually learn better from that live person than from a screen. Um, the American Academy of uh, Pediatricians um, does recommend that even older older children shouldn't spend more than two hours on a screen uh, a day. And you know that almost seems like laughable in our day and age where kids are spending like six, seven, eight hours on a screen when you put all those screens, you know, when all the different places they can watch a screen, a phone, a tablet, the TV. Um, but it does affect a child's ability to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and so you do want to limit that as much as possible. There are probably going to be times where, practically speaking, you do you, you, you um, need to be able to do something around the house or around uh, away from your baby. And you may have to provide a screen. Of course, you want to certainly do something educational as much as possible. But I will try and keep those to a minimum and really plan around toys that could distract them um, or, or, or that they could interact with, I should say, um, and probably learn that way. Um, but again, it's one of um, it, it's the world we live in right now. And I think you just sort of do the best you can um, and, and yep. And, and try not to beat yourself over the head. Just really do the best you can. Limit the screen time as much as possible when you are recognizing that um, they will learn better from you than from a screen. Sure thing, Doc. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to pivot a little bit and talk about, you know, as your child is growing, um, you as a parent, you're observing them. And, you know, there may be some telltale signs that maybe they're not developing um, uh, like other children, if you will. Um, statistically speaking, one in six children uh, or about 17 percent of children in the United States have one or more developmental disorders. I know that when it comes uh, to one such disorder, uh, developmental disorders like autism, you're looking at about one in every 44 child. Uh, in your opinion, doctor, what are some signs that parents should maybe look for to let you know that, hey, you know, maybe get your child evaluated as they're developing, you know, along the trajectory of development, what are some signs that we should look for to see if our child has or may potentially have um, developmental issues or developmental disorders? Yeah, this is one where I think I really want to encourage parents to keep to the regular schedule for the well child exams for their um, babies and toddlers and children as they get older, um, because that's one of the main things a pediatrician will do um, or a provider will do. Uh, at those visits, which is screened for developmental um, issues or developmental disorders. Um, and so because some of them are sometimes those, they can be very subtle and you might miss them for several months or even years, but can be picked up if those visits are kept and your pediatrician is able to sort of explore that. Um, I will say, again, it's going to really depend on the time of, of how old the, the, the your child is. Uh, but you want to look at development of language, right? Mm -hmm. um, most most babies are going to start to maybe say some words um, about anywhere from nine months to a year. Um, but if your child is past a year and they're not saying any words at all, it's certainly um, cause for um, concern and to actually look to make sure everything is okay. Now, they may just have just a 
speech delay, um, but that's, and that would be great, you know, because they can probably pick, uh, you can probably provide, not probably, you, you can provide speech therapy to help with that, but it's maybe just an, uh, an early sign of something else going on. So that would be one thing to look for is speech development. Another thing would just be to look for the ability to interact with you, to look you in the eye, for you to be able to engage them um, as they get older, into your toddler years, the ability to sort of um, interest you in things you're doing, or be interested in what you're doing. And so if you're seeing that there is a lack of that connection where it seems like they're off in their own world, um, that may be another course also um, something to bring up to your pediatrician uh, mm -hmm. so they can explore that um, further. But of course, you may have physical development issues like they're not walking and they're past the year, they're 15 months, 18 months, they're still not walking. Um, those would be some, of course, some issues to bring up as well. Thank you for that. One of the scarier moments in, in our child's, um, you know, growth was, um, you know, there was a period of time where she was just crying. And I remember my wife would look at her and try to figure out, um, you know, what it is that she wanted. You know, I, sometimes, you know, she would offer her food. She would offer mm -hmm. her, you know, her breast. She would try all these different things. And the child is, you know, just wouldn't stop crying. And, and, you know, we're looking at it and we're thinking, well, you know, she's, she's a healthy child. There's nothing that seems to be wrong. But then we came across the term colic, you know, which is when a child <laughs> cries often and excessively. So yeah. do you have any advice for, um, you know, parents to know, uh, or do you have any advice when it comes to colic? Yeah, that's always a very challenging um, condition. And it is one that you determine from elimination. So you make sure there's nothing else going on. Um, but if everything else seems well with your baby and they're still crying, um, and it's and it's usually now with colic, that crying is usually around a certain period of time every day. So it's usually not very variable. It's not like one day it's in the morning and one day it's in the afternoon and different days in the evening. It's usually about the same time of the day, generally speaking, and um, nothing seems to suit them. Um, the good news is eventually goes away. Now it may take several months, a couple of months to to go away um, or to to um, um, improve or resolve. But uh, I would say a couple of things that you could try is um, probiotics. Sometimes may be helpful. And mm -hmm. there are these days probiotics for babies that may be helpful. That may help with some gut bacteria. Sometimes some of these babies have gas. And that can also contribute to that. So this may be uh, something that may help with that. Um, rhythmic vault sounds sometimes will suit some of these babies. So running a vacuum cleaner right around that time around them. So for some babies will actually suit them and get them to settle. Um, that's something that you could try. Um, more involved, maybe putting them in a car seat and going for a ride around the neighborhood. <laughs> Some babies will settle with that as well. Um, but generally speaking, it is just a very trying period. And um, there are some aspects to caring for a newborn that you just can't sugarcoat and, you know, it's just difficult. Mm -hmm. And um, and just to take sort of con comfort in the fact that uh, millions and millions of moms and parents have gone through the... <laughs> The same thing I've survived and you probably would do just fine also. That's and I think this is where it's important for parents to also care for themselves and to realize that they need to really make sure they're being intentional about self-care. And that doesn't mean hours and hours in a spa or something along those lines. You know, it could just be as simple as taking a walk for 15, 20 minutes. It could be as um, simple as trying to get as much sleep as you can when your baby is resting. Um, things like that, that sort of allow you to rest and, and be in um, your highest form to care for your baby. Well, and, and I want to touch, uh, uh, you know, address a point you made, which is about the importance of self-care um, mm -hmm. for new moms. Um, you know, how important is it? Because I feel like as a new mother, um, and, you know, even myself as a, as a father, you know, your whole world centers around a child. And so I find that both my wife and I often play hot potatoes with our daughter. You, know, <laughs> you take her and I'll go and do whatever I need to do here mm -hmm. and everything. But how important is self-care? Because I, I would imagine it would affect even your ability to produce milk, right? Breast milk. Yes, yes. The more stress you are, the less breast milk you produce. It definitely is important. And I think that that's something that we're um, 
thankfully is being spoken about a bit more now. Um, and one of the, one of the things I focus with new moms as well is taking time for themselves. Now, again, this doesn't have to be anything complicated or t- or, or time consuming. Um, but for a mom, for instance, of a newborn, you know, those first few weeks, it's really important for her to sleep and rest as much as she can. And so if she's not careful, she may find herself doing things while the baby is sleeping, trying to catch up. So we're cleaning, we're sending out social media posts, we're like tidying up, we're cooking. But what happens then is when your baby wakes up, they need all of you again, right? And then mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you've had no rest all day long. Um, and also a lot of newborns will have this sort of sleep reversal where they are mostly, as- they're more asleep during the daytime and more awake at night. But if a new mom also is trying to stay awake more during the daytime to take care of all these tasks, then she's up all, all day and also up all night taking care of a newborn. And that is very tasking. So it, it does take some intention to say, okay, I may have to make peace with a messy home or things not being done right now, but I'm going to rest when my baby's resting as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's again, as simple as drinking more water, just being more intentional about being of high, more intentional about hydrating. It could be as simple as as a partner giving you a back rub of food massage, right? Um, I, I heard a really nice tip once where, someone was saying just go on a coffee date with your significant other right because it's easy to just throw if you're thinking of a dinner date you know that's like almost non-existent when you have a newborn but it's easier to just throw your baby into a car seat get a diaper bag and go off to your um, local coffee shop that you enjoy and have a beverage that's safe you know for your newborn if you're breastfeeding um, and come back right without too much of a production but all those things will feed your soul um, having friends over that you that really you know are helpful and that you can um, have some meaningful interaction with those things can be very helpful for a new mom and I think focusing on self-care is definitely something that will pay dividend amen brother I appreciate that <laughs> I'll have to share that with my wife <laughs> um, yeah, so in, in your uh, let's talk a little bit about your business um, you know the newborn prep academy now on your website you offer uh, two things that are very interesting. You offer uh, a resource guide for for new mom called the Confident New Mom Resource Guide. So tell us a little bit about that resource that's available on your website. Sure, sure. So um, on the website, newbornprepacademy.com, I do have, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a quick resource I put together called the Confident Mom Mindset, a Confident Mom Guide, which walks through, again, the Confident Mom Mindset I talked about earlier on, walks through some common things that moms may see in their newborns that are normal, uh, but um, but can be worrisome if they're not aware of it. Um, it ta- gives a few examples of some things that they should pay attention to and know when to seek help for their, for their babies. Um, and it's over the years, I've just cared for so many babies and I've seen moms come into the office worried about some condition or the other that really wasn't very significant. And which unfortunately has stolen all these hours or days um, of a mom's um, peace of mind because she's worrying about this one condition. Whereas if she had known this ahead of time, um, it will have been maybe uh, help alleviate some of that anxiety when she encountered whatever the condition is. Mm-hmm. And um, and so I sort of developed a preparation course called the newborn preparation course that moms can take that allows them to be able to prepare for the newborns even before their babies come or shortly after their babies arrive that prepares them for that period um, so that there's you can't know everything there is to know about caring for a newborn right. um, even that sometimes is the problem is when moms try to go out for that information they're so overwhelmed by all the information out there but you really only need to know a few key things to help you be prepared for your newborn when they arrive. Mm-hmm. And you also have a checklist for selecting pediatrician. So what yes. would you say are some key uh, points that people should be mindful of in their quest to finding uh, the best uh, pediatrician for them? Yeah. Yeah. I think the one, one thing they can take advantage of, which a lot of pediatricians will offer is a visit, a free visit to come sit with them, talk to them, meet them in person. If you have that opportunity, I will actually, I think that's one of the best things a mom could do because 
when you sit down with the person, you're able to sort of get a sense of how, what their philosophy is. You can ask them what their philosophy is for taking care of newborns. You can, or taking care of kids. You can get to have a sense if this is someone that will collaborate with you to care for your newborn, or if it's someone that may be more dictatorial. Um, you can just get a vibe if you feel you can be comfortable with this person. Um, so that's one thing I would suggest um, is being able to visit. Um, you want to look at just simple things as location. You know, is it convenient? In the first year of life, you're going to be having maybe anywhere from eight to 10 visits with a newborn to that doctor's office. And so if they're like 45 minutes, an hour away, um, you just have to kind of keep that in mind. Now, it may be the best option for your baby. And so you don't mind driving that far. But again, just re realizing that there are going to be many visits to the to that office and, and um, seeing if that's going to be convenient or something that you're okay with. Um, if they are available after hours, especially for a newborn, because you might have questions, they are not quite sure this necessarily, you are alarmed enough to call 911 or drive to the ER, but you're also not sure if it's something that can wait till the next day when the doctor's office is open. So someone that you can call after hours might be helpful uh, for you in that situation. Thank you for that, doctor. So I, I wanna dive into the newborn preparation course itself. Um, why did you create that course? Uh, you know, what did you hope to accomplish and who was your target audience with uh, the newborn preparation course? Sure. Yeah. So it's created for new moms. Um, and I would say new parents because I've had some dads take the course as well and really got some value from it. And <clears throat> again, this was just out of years of caring for newborns and realizing that there are a number of things moms aren't aware of. Um, that really will allow for a better experience and allow them to truly enjoy or at least enjoy better that newborn period, um, which is already a very stressful period um, if they were just armed with this information ahead of time. And so it talks about just first of all, preparing a mom for this period. Um, it talks about we address sleep and how to maximize your sleep during this period. We talk about the benefits of breastfeeding and formula feeding. And in, if you plan on doing both, how to successfully do both, um, 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 uh, successfully both breastfeed and formula feed. Uh, we talk about how to, what to do if things don't go as planned. And one of the challenging things of taking care of a newborn is they don't come with a manual and they also don't necessarily read your plan or necessarily agree with what your vision for them <laughs> was, right? So you may have a mom who really wants to breastfeed, uh, but, but that just isn't in the car. It's just because of the, the way that interaction has gone or, or a mom who really wanted to, you know, um, um, or a child who is sick, you know, uh, maybe there is some condition has de developed in a newborn. How do you handle those situations? Kind of prepare moms and parents for that as well. Um, we talk about how to recognize significant issues and when to seek help right away for those issues. Um, simple things as even your baby's poop. <laughs> that can be, over the years, I've realized, you know, is something that parents um, really worry about a lot because that can take so many different forms and it's very different from normal adult poop. And so you can be quite uh, alarmed sometimes when you see what it looks like or what color it is or what um, consistency it is or the frequency. All of those things oh, yeah. may look like small things, but they're things that still still from the whole experience of caring for a newborn and things that really um if you again you're armed ahead of time i mean even just the first hour first couple of hours after a baby's born we kind of go into re really what happens because most moms are just not prepared for what happens mm -hmm. um the, the baby comes out there's all kinds of things going on in the room with the baby and um and they may not even know to advocate for some things like skin to skin time with their newborns uh, right after delivery and that may not be universally done everywhere although there is uh, it's much better these days um so that's um sort of what at the end of the day it's to have a mom and a parent who's confident caring for the newborn and who's able to have a better experience with that newborn um, after the baby arrives. Thank you for that. And uh, by the way, as we upload this interview on YouTube, we will have a link in the description to leading back to your website, to the Newborn Prep Academy. So all those who watch this will be able to click on that link, which will take them directly so they can sign up. But tell us a little bit about the course itself. How long is it? You know, how much should it cost? And certainly how often do you offer it? Sure, sure. Right now it's um offered about quarterly, so um it's going to be open for for enrollment um towards the end of um, September. Um, it is a four week 
live course. So I actually teach the course live for four consecutive weeks for just an hour. They're very short, um, uh, short segments. Uh, so you're able, and they also you ha have a replay available as well after the course or after the session. So you're able to go back and watch it. You have access to it for a year. Um, it is two forty nine for the course. And again, you have access for over a year, replays um, and support. And then there are some bonus sessions. So uh, there's a bonus session with a doula who's able to sort of talk about the services a doula uh, provides and um, also just prepare moms for how to go through the birthing process um, more um, to prepare them for the birthing process and how to handle that. Uh, there's going to be a bonus session with um, a breastfeeding specialist um, just who can handle all the questions that moms may have around breastfeeding and another specialist who will be talking about sleep and how to get sleep, restful sleep, both for mom and for baby and sleep training and all the things that um, come along with sleep and a newborn. Um, so um, yeah, basically a four-week course with these bonus sessions. So I didn't day like eight sessions together, all together. Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh so one thing that I always wanted to ask is this postpartum depression, mm. uh, about postpartum depression, you know, and it's yeah. quite common. What exactly um, may be the cause for it? Is it just that uh, mothers are overwhelmed uh, with the new uh, changes in their lives? Is it the surge in hormones that's causing this? Or is it that they feel um, maybe that they're not ready? What, in your opinion, has contributed to it? And how do you then advise these women, these new mothers to um, deal with this postpartum depression? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so um, there are a number of factors at play oftentimes. Um, so you do have the fact that there is a hormonal component. You know, you've had um, estrogen, um, oxytocin um, during helping with pregnancy and sustaining pregnancy. Um, it's almost like a feel good hormone, but that drops drastically after baby is born. And so that in and of itself will cause some depressed mood. And oftentimes it's called the baby blues. But when that goes past a couple of weeks, you know, then you're really worried that this may be more than just a baby blues, but um, postpartum depression. Um, you have just the task, uh, how tasking it is to care for a newborn. Like you were saying is like barely any sleep, you know, rest um, during that period. There's so much going on and it can feel very overwhelming. Um, and so all those things can um, um, contribute to being, having postpartum depression. Maybe you've had a history of depression already from the past, which increases your risk of having postpartum depression as well. Um, so a number of factors. And I think also um, we live in a time where the uh, isn't as much social support as we will have seen maybe 40, 50, 60 years ago, or in even some countries around the world right now where they still have a rich social network around a new mom, where you have aunties and moms and grandmas and people around that can help her and support right. her during that process. Um, oftentimes, especially in the Western world, um, a mom is going through this alone. You know, her and her partner are going through this mostly alone, right? And they may not even be able to afford to have someone come into the home and help them. And so um, it can be quite tasking. I think all these things can contribute to um, postpartum depression and something um, that uh, because there's oftentimes a stigma to mental health to start with, moms may not even seek help for it. Mm -hmm. uh, which is unfortunate. And I hopefully, and thankfully, there's more and more awareness and uh, moms have been empowered. And I certainly empower moms to speak up if they are feeling really depressed and they're not able to get out of it. And they're feeling um, like hardening themselves or their babies. So they're feeling very irritable um, and they're crying all the time. Uh, and now again, all these things may happen to some degree in the first couple of weeks, but if this is going past two weeks and you're still feeling all of these, um, you should really seek out seek out some some men, some help from your provider. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that, doctor. Um, and lastly, I, I want to ask, um, you know, go back a little bit in the uh, process of birthing to, you know, C-section and natural birth. Mm. Um, I, I read uh, not too long ago <clears throat> something very interesting that th there was a study done in the UK where they were able to find the same type of uh, microbe or pathogen that was in the hospital it was more prevalent in children who were born, uh, birthed through C-section as opposed mm -hmm. to children that are born through natural uh, route, right? Yeah. And, and so 
in your humble opinion, what are some of the advantages? I, I understand not everybody can give birth uh, through a natural route, but I do want to pick your brain a little bit to see, you know, what some of the advantages are in terms of, of uh, natural birth compared to C-sections. Yeah. Um, you know, w- what I will say to that is that at the end of the day, you want a child who is delivered safely. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yes, it'd be great to be able to uh, give birth. Well, let's say one option will be to give birth to a child naturally, and that's uh, vaginally. And that will be the vast majority of, of, new, of moms who will give birth that way. Now, there are times where Thankfully, we're in an a- day and age where we are able to intervene when it's not safe for the baby to come that way. Maybe it's a prolonged um, labor or or there is some mismatch of the baby size and mom's pelvis or there is some bleeding or some emergency that's going on that now necessitates for this baby to be delivered um, emergently. And that's where, um, thankfully, there is the option of having a cesarean section and getting your baby out safely. Now, after that first cesarean section, there is an opportunity to, in some cases, have a vaginal, try for a vaginal birth after that cesarean section, um, call a VBAC, uh, vaginal birth after cesarean section. Um, and I think that's where you have a conversation with your, with your obstetrician, um, looking at your risks, looking at uh, whether this may be a safe option for you, um, you might need to advocate for it if you really feel strongly about wanting to do a vaginal birth and understanding if you um if if you're a candidate for that. Now there may be some reasons why that's not a good or a safe option for you um, after you've had the first zero section. But again, that should be a conversation that you have with your obstetrician. And um, and if you're not clear why they're suggesting a zero section, really ask it. I think it's um uh, in general, something that we're really encouraging patients to do more of these days, which is to advocate for themselves and, you know, for their um, right. their um, babies and, and children where that's the case. Um, because I think for a number of years, um, people have been intimidated by doctors and we just do whatever a doctor says, you know, but I think it's important for you to understand why they're suggesting something. And oftentimes it's um, well thought out reason but you should understand that and make sure that you're comfortable with that and seek a second opinion if you need to. Yeah. And I agree. I agree because I think not just in, in the birthing process, but in healthcare in general, people mm-hmm. tend to be very intimidated by doctors, right? right? It's almost like, I think back to those commercials you see on TV that says when diet and exercise mm-hmm. aren't enough. But the question is, Really? When have, <laughs> what kind of diet are you eating? You know, like you can you can optimize your health and, and deal with most chronic diseases through a particular diet and, and a regimen of exercise. I mean, that always works. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, or but just people not willing to do what is required. To make right, it work. right, right, right. <laughs> so you know, it makes you wonder. But I, I think that one of the main reasons we started this podcast, the Self Care Forum podcast was really to to give people, the audience, not only information, but information that would empower them. You should be able to have a conversation with your doctor without feeling intimidated. You should yeah. know that, you know, you have options, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you're, you're essentially uh, going to a doctor for a service. If you don't like yes. the service or the way you're being treated, you have every right to go and shop around. Absolutely. And doctor, we, we have... Uh, you know, those options available to us. But for a lot of people, they just kind of deal with it, you know, and just kind of, mm-hmm. you know, uh, unfortunately to their detriment. But I love that, you, you know, you encourage patients to talk to their doctors, you know, if you feel strongly about a particular approach, then discuss it, right? Don't, yep. And let there be a logical reason for why the doctor's advocating another way. Right. And it has to make sense to you. Otherwise, you're just being forced into something that's yeah. not safe or comfortable doing. Absolutely. And that affects compliance also in many cases, too, because you're not fully if you're not fully bought into what the plan is, then you may not fully carry it out. That's right. That's right. Well, Dr. Obidi, look, I want to thank you for joining us here on the Self-Care Forum podcast. I, I truly do appreciate you giving us so much of your time. Of course, uh, for those who are watching. 
Um, this interview will be available on, on our YouTube channel, um, along with all the information um, to your Newborn Prep Academy, as well as uh, links to your resources, I think, for any expectant parents, uh, mothers and fathers. Um, I definitely think you should take advantage of these free resources. And I believe you have a uh, blog as well, correct? Yes, I do have a, a blog. I put out a short video every week um, and it's all housed on newbornprepacademy.com. Hopefully it's helpful for moms and, and parents. Yes, sir. And of course, for those who want to follow up, you know, follow up with you and your work, how can they, you know, how can they find you on social media and how can they find you? Um, you know, just tell us where you're located again. Please. Sure, sure. So again, the website is newbornprepacademy.com. They can sign up for a wait list um, so they are the first to know when the enrollment opens for the newborn preparation course. Um, the free resources you mentioned, um, there are links for them also on that website. And they also houses a blog. I have several videos on there that may be helpful. Um, on Instagram, I am at Dr. Obidi. So it's D-R-O-B-I-D-I. And on Facebook, Dr. M. Obidi, D R E M E K A O B I D I. Now I was just gonna say, and thank you very much for having me on. This is such such a a, a treat and and a joy to to um talk about all these topics with you. No, no, it's wonderful. And where are you located again? Sure, I'm in Hagerstown, Maryland. So that's in Western Maryland. Um, yep, in the the tri tri state area. So we're very close to West Virginia and Virginia. Okay, and and uh, I'm getting a uh, I'm getting another question. What uh, just uh, I don't think it was clarified throughout the uh, podcast, but what age of patients do you generally see on that? Uh, oh, I'm a pediatrician, so I take care of of newborns from um, day zero to. In my practice, I go up to twenty three years of age, so young adults. Um, but um, really. Um, yeah, so as, I, as the physical practice, I take care of, of all, all kids of all ages. Um, on our online, I do cater just for newborns and supporting moms um, to care for the newborns. Well, Dr. Obidi, I want to thank you so much for joining us this evening on the Self-Care Forum podcast. We're going to stop recording right now. We do have some questions that uh, I want to uh, go ahead and read over to you, if that's okay. Sure, absolutely. Thanks again for having me on. Listen to the audio version of the Self-Care Forum podcast on Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts.